We talked at the beginning about how I have the the capture background, right? And when I came up with these points, uh, I just want you to know that I have a lot of experience with managing proposals. Uh, and more importantly, I understand from managing proposals the things that are going to get you in trouble when it comes to actually preparing your response. Uh, so that's that's what this list is. This is a list of things that people are going to get into trouble with or that they're going to run into um, that are avoidable. So uh, stuff I want you to start thinking about now. Um, not bidding, but for the wrong reasons. This is something that we expect people are going to run into. If you're really busy or if you're looking at the, uh, the RFP and you're just feeling kind of overwhelmed, um, you know, it may be that you're not a good fit for Polaris, but but don't count yourself out of running without doing a little bit of the, the homework uh, and at least taking a look at the eligibility criteria and taking a look at your your uh, projects that you have um, or examining teaming as an option. You know, this is going to be a long run, high ceiling IDIQ uh, for IT services, and it's specifically set aside for small businesses. Uh, so this is you know, don't we just don't want you to count yourself out of the opportunity or count on an on ramp later on down the road uh, without you know making an informed decision. Um, the next thing that that I think people are going to get into trouble with is making a faulty bid strategy. So I mentioned that a lot of the criteria is very objective, right? It's very binary. It's black and white. You meet the criteria or you don't. That doesn't mean that you're going to be able to throw together a proposal response two weeks before it's due. Uh, there's going to be a lot of homework that you need to do uh, now to make sure that all of your, your contract documentation is in order and that you're organized and ready to submit. Um, and then, you know, the, the other side of that is it's not just the taking time to prepare the proposal. It's making sure that you are, are going into this with, uh, you know, an, an, again, informed position about what projects qualify and what don't. So this isn't the time to say, well, we've got one really good project. Let's just throw it into the ring and, and see if it works. Um, it's probably not going to. So thinking through, you know, your teaming strategy, uh, thinking through which performance areas you're going to have covered, you know, that, that's something that we want you to do up front so that your bid strategy is actually deliberate. Um, I expect people will get into trouble with forming too big or too complex of a team. Uh, if you have looked at the draft RFP, there's really specific guidance about all of the admin that you have to provide that shows, you know, what your relationships are, that proves you've done the work you're claiming you've done. Um, and so, you know, you as the prime need to have a very good attention to detail, and so do all of your teammates, uh, because everybody's got to meet the minimum criteria, uh, and everybody has to be in lockstep when it comes to, you know, presenting their compliance and being able to prove that, that everything that they're claiming is actually what's happening. Um, so the the other thing that I want you to keep in mind when you're you're forming your team is that it doesn't help to have teammates who are stacking experience in one project area. Again, coverage across all the performance areas is going to be a better strategy uh, than having, you know, three teammates that all have a performance or that all cover the same performance area because you're going to max out points uh, just based on the way that they have the draft RFP structured. Um, uh, other things that people are going to get into trouble with is not preparing in the right way and not understanding the difference between a claim and evidence. And what I mean by this is that uh, there is a difference. If you have to submit your statement of work, there's a difference if the government says that work may include performance outside of the country versus something that says performance will take place outside of the country. So there's little language nuances uh, that exist in contract documentation that you want to be aware of now. So if you're counting on proving OCONUS uh, performance just based on what's in the statement of work, you're going to want to take a look at that and make sure that it actually does say what you think it says. Um, you know, along with that, um, they the government has allowed contract deliverables like monthly status reports or staffing reports uh, or you know it, things that you uh, provide to the government as an official deliverable. They have allowed companies to submit that as evidence. Um, I would expect that they do that or that. That they will do that for Polaris as well. We're still kind of waiting on the again that finalization, um, and I'm sure it's one of the questions that's been asked that we haven't seen a response to yet. Um, but I mention that now because if you don't have something explicitly stated in your statement of work, but it's substantiated in a deliverable, like that might be enough to get you credit in one of those point scoring categories. But only if it's all um, tightened up in terms of. Uh, meeting the standard of evidence. So what by that, I mean, like, does it have the contract number on it? Does it explicitly state who's doing what and where they're doing it? 
And if it doesn't, you have time now to put that into a deliverable to get it signed off on by the government so that you're not trying to trace down or track down um, evidence that isn't there and you're not trying to manufacture it once the RFP is live because by then it's going to be too late. So taking stock now of what your documents actually say, uh, making sure that they prove the things that you are going to say that they prove uh, can save you some headaches down the road. Um, another thing, it would be ignoring the emerging tech uh, and th those kind of projects. So the primary performance areas, those are those are the ones that we want to make sure you have covered. And there's million dollar thresholds for those. For the emerging technology, there's six emerging technology areas. The project threshold is much lower. I think it's $150,000. Um, and it's because these are these are the more innovative side of things. This comes second in the RFP and the project values are less, but don't be don't be fooled into thinking that these are not still important. Uh, again, the, the most attractive offer to the government is gonna be a team that can cover all of the performance areas and has demonstrated experience against as many of the emerging technology areas as possible. Uh, and then the last thing that we expect to, to see teams you know, get, get tripped up by is expecting work about the work. You know, getting on the IEDIQ is kind of just the first step. Um, and in some ways, it's the easy part of this process. Uh, you know, even though there's going to be some stiff competition, um, getting on the IDIQ in order to actually get work and not get off ramped because you're not meeting the minimum contracting thresholds, you're going to have to put in a significant amount of time and investment to make sure that you're steering customers to use this IDIQ so that you're, you're competitive at the task order level uh, and that you're meeting the thresholds each year to make sure that you don't, um, sorry, to make sure that your company is set up for long term success. So your goal here should not be just getting an award on Polaris, it should be positioning for the long-term success, you know, whether that's making business development uh, uh, investments now, whether that's forming strategic teams, um, but looking down the road and saying, okay, what do we need not just to get onto Polaris, but to stay on Polaris and make it work for us so that it's not just a headache uh, and this thing that becomes a, you know, a massive time suck and resource suck on our company. We do have some free checklists that are on our website that you can download if you're looking to do this just basic eligibility check. The first thing before you put any effort towards bidding on Polaris is making sure that you don't have any showstoppers, right? So we've developed a really user-friendly checklist that just walks you top to bottom through the basic eligibility criteria. Anything in red, we want you to stop and take a look at because it's either a disqualifier and a showstopper or it's something you're gonna have to figure out uh, a workaround for. So if you have any issues here, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out. We'd be happy to help you run through this. Uh, but yeah, Nelson's just showing a, a zoomed in view now where, you know, it's really user friendly. It's dead simple. Um, and this is based on the criteria that are in the draft RFP. So it just walks you through each category that you're going to have to think through. Um, the next thing we have is a it's an actual project evaluation sheet. And there's uh, there's two of these on our website. One is for the um, the primary experience areas, and the other is tailored specifically for an emerging technology project. And what I want you to do is I would run this checklist against every project that you're considering. Uh, again, we don't know the specific point breakdown yet, but we almost don't need to, right? Because you just need to know what's in your projects and what they cover or what they don't cover so that when we do get numerical values, we can plug those in and it becomes a math problem about you know which project is going to score you the, the most amount of points. Uh, any questions about this? Like I said, they're on our website. They're free to download. Um, they're, they're tools for you to use to really help you get you know, organized at the onset while we still have some, some runway uh, before that proposal calendar starts. <laughs>